Christine, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. We're really excited to talk about landscapes. Thanks for having me. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, so how are you? I mean, just in general, I, I know, I, I feel like your book touches on so many big subjects. <laughs> I feel like we should start with like, how are you? <laughs> I'm, I'm doing well. Um, you know, it's, it's been, uh, quite an intense year just with the editing and all the kind of, um, marketing stuff. So I'm kind of taking a bit of a break, just, uh, having a staycation here in Vancouver. Oh, nice. So really nice. Yeah. I, yeah. how long have you lived in Vancouver? Um, I, I grew up here and, uh, but I was away for about like nine years. So I've been back since 2015. Oh, okay, so cool. I've while. spent yeah. quite a bit of time in Vancouver. So I'm, oh, I bet for filming. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Between acting and directing. It's, I, yeah. I actually went for the very first time when I was like, I guess I was 13 when yeah. I was in intersection. So I was there, I lived with my mom in a hotel for like <laughs> four months and oh, then, yeah. um, yeah. And then I went back when I did the pilot for house and then I did some independent films there. And then I've shot several things as a director that it, it's been wild. Oh, so wow. do you live in the actual city or kind of, I do, I, I live downtown. Um, oh, so okay. I just, I moved downtown about like five years ago. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's very vibrant. It's exciting. Um, and, and I think that it's changed a lot over the years, like definitely, you know, over the past 10, 15 years, it's really grown as a city, which, which is um, interesting to, 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 to witness. Yeah. Yeah. Do you feel like more, not that we will talk for too long about Vancouver, but I felt like <laughs> when I was, I, cause I lived there from 2011 to 2017 and mm. the change that happened in that time of like the amount of like incredible restaurants that came in yes. and even like health food stores and juice shops. And, you know, it was like I don't know. It just felt like it completely exploded with like a whole different level of, um, I don't know, just like diverse opportunities that were, yeah. that were there. Um, no, absolutely. but I also felt like that there was a point where not a lot of people actually lived downtown. Like mm -hmm. it was like, there were a lot of buildings that were sold out, but it was like all the lights were off and no one was like actually living there. Is it, is that shifting a little bit or? maybe I, I mean I, I still see a lot of like empty units when I look out and the, yeah. units, the lights aren't on um I so I think there's still a lot of um you know people investing in units without actually living in them unfortunately I mean the real estate situation just gotten worse in Vancouver um but but you're right like the city has become just you know kind of livelier more crowded a lot more people here now lots of restaurants um we now have Michelin star restaurants which is kind of exciting um you it's know so cool yeah yeah, so it's it is um it is uh, an interesting place to be in. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I always you know it's like when I was there, I was like, oh man, it rains a lot. And then when I'm not there, I'm like, I kind of miss it. Really? <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. I yeah, I I've always lived in rainy places, and one day I would like to live in a place that doesn't rain. So yes, <laughs> it doesn't rain much in your book. <laughs> no, that's true. It doesn't. <laughs> it's unusual yeah. for England because it's always rainy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um. Well, well, so we're talking about landscapes, which is this beautiful book that um that Christine wrote, and I. I'm just curious to know like what the seed idea was, you know, I mean, obviously the structure is within kind of diary entries um, and it, it, there's metaphor on top of metaphor. I feel like in terms of the way you look at art and mm -hmm. art sort of feels like visual memories in a certain way. And then there's also this sort of cycle of life thing that's happening in terms of things being created and destroyed and there's beauty in its creation and in its destruction you know it's I mean it's it goes on and on and it's hard I, I don't even think I'm going to try to fully explain all of it to a reader because I would just say go read the book because um it's such a beautiful experience to take all of that in um but I'm just always curious like where does that seed idea come from you know like was it was it a character that kind of was you know were you thinking about Penelope and I want to do these journal entries through the lens of a woman who is an art historian or were you thinking about the climate and what's happening with the way things are changing and the kind of catastrophe elements that are in the news every day you know what I'm saying so mm -hmm. you know yeah. just kind of explain what your experience of that seed idea was 
Yeah. So, I mean, I started with the setting, actually, that's kind of how I often start with, mm. or with like an image of a place. Okay. So in this case, it was kind of the dilapidated country estate. I've always been interested in country house novels, like um, Ishiguro's Remains of the Day. So I think there's this like long history of novels set in country houses. Yeah. But um, I was specifically interested in, uh, you know, a house that's kind of ruinous, it's falling apart. Um, and um, the the novels of W. G. Zabold, um, who's you know uh, always a huge source of inspiration for me. Um, he has all of these dilapidated houses um, and buildings in his novels, so that's kind of where a, a lot of that came from. And um, a friend also sent me um, the photographs of a Belgian-based photographer named Myrna Pavlovich. Okay. So she just goes to all of these abandoned houses and, you know, estates and castles in Europe and photographs them. And they're just the most breathtaking and beautiful images. Um, and it's it's strange to think that decay could be beautiful. Um, so I just wanted to bring that into, um, in, into fictional form. And yeah, so I started with that. And then I kind of came up with this image of a woman in the house living with these objects that she's trying to kind of preserve. Yeah. Uh, and so everything else just kind of like followed. Um, and I did a lot of research and and often the writing just happens alongside the research. So I didn't really plan ahead of time. Interesting. So yeah, so everything such as, you know, the, 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 um, the, the climate related issues, the trees dying, all of that kind of came out of the research process. Yeah. So it's not outlined. It's not it's carefully planned. No. It's to, sort of intuitively pulling you through. That's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Is that terrifying or is that wonderful? A little bit. <laughs> I guess it's both. You know, I mean, it, it gives me a sense of freedom so I can kind of do what I want. Yeah. And then during the editing process, I would kind of look, look over everything and figure out what works and what doesn't. Yeah. And there was a lot of cutting, like um, the original draft. So even before I submitted it to agents and editors, it was almost double the length so I cut a lot wow so, yeah. that's I mean that's brave though that's hard to do on your own I, oftentimes I feel like people don't do that until they have an editor how did how how can you delineate you know when you're that close to it to figure out what you want to keep and what you feel like can fall away it's hard I, I think it's just um there's a lot of trial and error um and I tend to take breaks in between drafts so I think that stepping away from it gives you like a sense of clarity so I can kind of look at it with fresh eyes as much as possible and yeah like it's you know it will ever be the same as when someone else reads it and gives feedback sure um, so yeah so it just it that's why it took so many years um just you know a lot of going back and forth and 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 rewriting cutting and adding and yeah and then and then I eventually had the courage to submit um to to agents and and publishers yeah what what, what is that like are you just sending manuscripts to people cold or you had relationships with certain people yeah. or well I the first time I submitted the manuscript in full was to um the novel prize which is um this kind of uh, competition for, for novels offered by New Directions and Fitzcarraldson Editions and Giramondo Publishing. So I'm a fan of, of all these presses. So I saw the um, the announcement in their newsletter. So I just decided I might as well go for it and just to try. Um, and I, I, I did not expect to be shortlisted. So that was, you know, really quite phenomenal. And that was really the first time I felt like maybe there is an audience for this book. Um, yeah. And so then after that, um, I edited and then just sent to to agents, um, not anyone I really knew. Um, though people did recommend certain agents, sure. um, and and that's that's how it kind of started. Yeah, so I I I think I've been really lucky that I've worked with you know incredible people um, and met a supportive agent. Um, so yeah, so it's it's been it's been you know a pretty good process. I think. Yeah, we we love two dollar radio over here. Oh, so, <laughs> um, how what once you know? I, I'm always curious about the editor relationship with novelists, just because it's something that typically doesn't doesn't get talked about that much. And I guess for me, coming from being a filmmaker, the editing process is such a huge you know it's the last rewrite basically um, mm -hmm. from from a script. And so I'm super interested in what that's like when when a novel is so intimate to you. It's, it's such a, it's just your your complete internal life and every word is yours. 
what does that process look like for you when you're going back and forth with an editor who's coming up with ideas or saying that maybe this doesn't need to be there? What does that, how does that look? Um, I thought it was a very rewarding process and that was probably my favorite part of mm. the entire kind of process of publishing. Just having that conversation with someone who has thought very deeply about the book as deeply as I have because yeah. I think that's such a privilege you know because I you know if I were to show the book to a friend I don't think the friend would devote that same amount of time and care into the manuscript so I just think having that relationship um was really just uh yeah it was it was really life-changing for me because it taught me a lot about I guess my weakness um as a writer and, and, and things I need to improve on um so you know uh, I, I I work with Eric at Two Dollar Radio as well as my um, Canadian editor Chiara at Double Day Canada um so they both gave suggestions and editorial changes so it was really interesting to also see the differences between um the two of them in terms of what hey, I was just gonna say what do you do when um, they have opposite notes <laughs> it, there were a few instances where, where they did have um opposite notes and I just had to kind of like either find compromise or choose which one yeah. I felt um was easier or um more compatible with the rest of the book um, yeah and it, it, yeah they, they gave me a lot of freedom in terms of what to do so a lot of the suggestions were kind of vague like I don't know um uh you know there needs to be more emotional intensity so it's it's not something very very specific most of the time so I find that the 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 kind of broader suggestions more challenging because I could you know approach um something like emotional intensity in a number of ways sure so so those those few months of of doing the substantive edits were, were quite stressful um and just because I knew there was a deadline and I had to do all these changes um but I think it was at the end it's very worthwhile you know I think the book is stronger because of these edits um, that's cool and, and same with the copy editing as well you know um just going through all the details and um uh yeah and just fixing fine tuning so I, I enjoyed that part as well so just so anyone listening is aware the structure of landscapes is a journal written by Penelope who is an art historian mm -hmm. and in between there are essays there are sort of uh uh like art history essays and also there are these little descriptions of the books that Penelope is actually archiving in this library mm -hmm. through the whole process. Um, so it's an interesting, very, uh, it's a, it, it all feels woven together in a, in a very cohesive and um, um, I, the word that comes to mind is cozy, like in a cozy way. Like I oh, felt so like <laughs> sort of wrapped into all of these different elements that really worked so nicely together. Um, and so anyway, I'm explaining that just for anyone who hasn't read it yet, who's listening, just because I'm super curious about, um, well, first of all, I know there's a tremendous amount of art that you describe in this book, which I'm sure you've been asked about a ton and is fascinating. Um, but also the books that you have her archiving and the ones that you've specifically chosen to highlight are of interest to me as well, because I, I'm curious how you, it seems like. I'm very confident that there's nothing you do on accident. So, you know, it, when you're going through and you're making this decision of, okay, so she has three or four journal entries. This is what's going on for her emotionally. And then this is the archival book that I'm going to use and slot in right here. How were you able to make those decisions? What was driving the decision-making with that layer of, of the structure? Yeah, so initially I, I wrote all of these parts separately so the the um the diary entries were written together then the, the I call them the archive mm -hmm. um, items or objects were written separately and the essays were written separately and then what I did was kind of um wove everything together so the 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 kind of the, the dovetailing only happened afterwards um, oh wow and so so yeah so the objects are meant to kind of evoke certain memories for Penelope mm. um so essentially I chose items to insert into particular places so that they kind of um, echo or resonate with what is happening in either in her like um, in, her, in her daily life or in terms of what she is remembering 
Um, so, so it's all of that is meant to kind of, they're meant to kind of go together. Um, a lot of the books um, that are included in the archive are actually books that were sources of inspiration for the writing of, of landscapes. Oh, that's um, cool. So that, um, that kind of reference as well. Um, yeah, and the the art essays um, are, are meant to be written by Penelope. And I was wondering, I was going to ask yeah. you that, actually. Later, I was like, I, they feel like... The, in the book. Okay. <laughs> I was like, am I right that these are her essays? <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're meant to be hers, um, but written in a very different style um, compared to the diaries, and that's intentional as well, because I wanted to show her, I guess, her changing relationship to the art. So, you know, the, the essays are meant to be written at an earlier stage in her life, um, when she, I guess she was um, still looking at the art from from a distance, like there's this kind of aloofness in the tone yeah. in the essays, whereas the diaries are much more like personal and there's this kind of like open endedness that maybe didn't exist in the essay. So I wanted to kind of, kind of contrast yeah. those um, two styles of writing. I'm so excited to share that our podcast is brought to you in partnership with Seed. As many of you know, I am a huge advocate of this incredible company and their DSO-1 Daily Symbiotic, which I have taken every day for years. DSO-1 is a two-in-one probiotic and prebiotic formulated with 24 clinically and scientifically studied strains for whole body benefits, including gut, skin, and heart health. I started taking Seed daily because I love how seriously they are about their science. It's formulated based on robust clinical and mechanistic research with probiotic strains. And super good news, there's no refrigeration necessary. Seed's patented capsule and capsule design safeguards probiotics through digestion for delivery of an average of 100% of their starting dose to your colon. I also love Seed's commitment to environmental health. They have developed probiotics for honeybees, coral reefs, and have created new standards and sustainable packaging. Your first month of Seed includes a refillable glass jar and complimentary vial for on the go, and refills arrive each month in a compostable bio pouch. For our listeners, Seed is offering 25% off your first order. Go to seed.com slash Jen's Bookshelf. Use code Jen's Bookshelf for 25% off your first order of Seed. How much did you toil over the visual descriptions of the, I feel like thousands of paintings that you described? And first <laughs> I was, at first I got a little scared because I was like, oh my gosh, I don't know enough art to read this book. And then the way you describe all of the paintings, it was so vivid that I thought, oh, I don't even, I mean, I did look them all up just because I was curious, <laughs> but I was like, I don't even need to look them up because she's described them in a way that's just so vivid that I can see it. I can see the painting in my head, but what's that process like to, to kind of get to a place where you go, oh yeah, I, I definitely described this in a way that a reader could see it in their mind at this point. That was really challenging. I mean, I, I love art, even though I don't have a background in art history. Um, and I often find myself you know, standing in front of a painting or a sculpture and just like not knowing what to say. Because mm. I think they they just, you know, art that really moves you, it, they just pose such a challenge. Um, and they, they really challenge language. Um, so, you know, it was it was something I really wanted to to attempt to to describe artwork because I think it's it's um you know, it, it's it's tremendously difficult, but it's very rewarding. And yeah. I get to spend a lot of time with uh, a piece of art. I mean, you know, the, the image yeah. of the piece of art, rather yeah. than seeing them in person. I mean, a lot of these I have seen in person, but but they're obviously they're not here. Um, and I, I I didn't travel to, to to see any of these in person. But um, yeah, actually, a lot of write, uh, readers have told me that they um, they they're always like googling when they're as they're reading the book. <laughs> oh, I mean, reading. so much. I have I have a whole file of like images <laughs> saved from Google where I was like, whoa, holy cow! But it became almost fun to go back and forth between it because yeah. I was like okay you've given me all these words that have provoked an image in my head of a piece of art I've never mm -hmm. seen and then to look at it and try to sort of compare what your words evoked next to what actually was being described and it was it's it's really fun I mean I feel like someone could do like a um an art tour based on landscapes like someone could do like a landscapes like museum challenge where you like have to try, try to go and find all the all the paintings that have oh, been mentioned be <laughs> um yeah so okay the visual stuff I'm trying I just I'm trying to think through all the things so right so that's what I was going to get to so 
you tackle something that is so um, huge, but it also feels very much like, uh, I don't know, you're, you're taking something that is very universal and is very timeless, but it's also meeting the moment that we're in right now in terms of the way that you're uh, bringing up what has happened in art through history, which is, you know, some of these more dangerous families have financed it at times. And there's this history of the money behind the art having a capitalistic and sort of nefarious uh, origin in some way. And yet they have financed this thing of beauty. And sometimes that thing of beauty, even though it's done in a beautiful way, is representing something violent, especially towards women or toward people who are um, disadvantaged in some way or, or, um, submissive in some way. And so, um, I thought that was super interesting. You know, you're talking, there's a section of the book and I, please forgive me for probably paraphrasing it horribly, but, um, where you, you're talking about, um, you know, how these people are saying that they love a piece of art, that women are talking about loving a piece of art. That's about the rape of the Sabine women. Mm -hmm. And yet, there's talking about the beauty of the brush strokes and the painting itself. And somehow they're compartmentalizing the concept of what's going on in the, in the image versus the execution of how they've made the image and how dangerous that can be. And I I'm just super interested in how you found your way into all that because nothing ever feels like preachy or heavy handed, but it does feel arresting, you know, like it's something that I hadn't thought a ton about the amount of museums that I've walked through and just thought, Oh, that's really, those colors are amazing or that's beautiful. And I haven't necessarily stopped to take in the subject matter and realize like, wait, what's actually happening in that image and what subconsciously subconsciously is that translating to my brain? You know what I mean? Yeah, um, I did a lot of research um, uh, about art history, mainly written by feminist art historians. So I'm so indebted to them. And and these books were absolutely eye-opening mm. to me. Um, because b- before I, I did this research, uh, you know, I, I, I was very much the same as what you described. I walked through galleries and, you know, I wouldn't necessarily be struck by the subject matter. Yeah. Um, I, and I, I've seen the, um, so I've been to Florence and I've seen the John Bologna and Cellini sculptures in, in person. And I just remember just being in awe of the way that they're able to like manipulate material, you know, and to make it look like flesh. And I was traveling with two male friends and I remember them saying, you know, it's a bit uncomfortable for them to look at Sculpture, but that didn't it, I didn't feel that way so I thought that was interesting that that they felt really uncomfortable looking at the sculpture of, of, of the naked women um, but I didn't necessarily feel that way and it was you know it took a lot of just reading and research for me to 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 notice that actually if you walk through any gallery um, there are all of these images of, of naked women or um, women who are fetishized and commodified in a particular way um, and, you know, when I was an undergrad, I did read um, John Berger's Ways of Seeing, um, but I guess it didn't, some of those ideas didn't really sink in until I saw these artworks and thought about them in a particular way. Um, but I, and so I, I've gone back and reread the book and I love how he, um, he, you know, he puts these like advertising images alongside mm. paintings by the old masters to essentially erase that boundary between high and low art and to to highlight the ways in which you know that kind of fetishization occurs at all levels of culture but we we become so used to these images we don't actually realize yeah. what they what what the implications are and that was kind of disturbing in some ways um when now you know every every time I, I look at something I'm thinking about um these ideas and it's kind of hard to um to unsee them in in, in some ways um yeah, and you know, I'm mean, and growing up, you know, be reading fashion magazines like I don't know, like Teen Vogue, and you know, we're just kind of brainwashed into seeing women and seeing ourselves in a particular way. Um, so now I'm much more aware of that and um, the way in which these images now also circulate on social media and how they might be <sighs> affecting young women. Yeah, so I do think it's it's such a relevant topic and not. And, you know, we do talk about that, I think, in terms of social media and advertisement, but not in terms of art. I think maybe some people feel like, you know, 
part is it's it's almost like a form of sacrilege to to talk about these ideas yeah and it's intimidating parts. right you know yeah. it's like even people who've yeah. studied art i would imagine it's it, you get in these situations where it, it's so subjective and yet certain people take on a tenor of confidence in the way that mm -hmm. they decide that they're going to assess something's beauty or its value and then you feel sort of pulled in to that mm -hmm. and going oh well I don't know a lot about art history but this person who supposedly does does is saying that this is a masterpiece I guess I'm trying to see how it's a masterpiece and I need to find a way to see that you know, even if what's standing out is but this horrible thing is happening to these women in this image you know and exactly. it's such a exactly. um I don't know it's it's just really interesting to think about the fact that right now it's easy for us to be like, oh my gosh, the world is just the worst because of social media and this and that or whatever. But then you look back mm -hmm. and we're looking at paintings that are from 500 years ago, a thousand years ago, like the, a version of this has been going on forever from the beginning of time. Mm -hmm. And, and it's mm -hmm. part of humanity. It's part of the, the thing that we have to constantly sift through as human beings on a daily basis to, to figure out how to, break free of the ideas other people have about wherever we fit oh, in society. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'm glad that, you know, there are more books about the subject now and, you know, books about the role that women artists have played throughout history. So I feel like there, you know, the, the conversation is, is shifting and yeah. there's kind of greater awareness. And I think that that's very positive. Um, there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, oh, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm just hoping to kind of contribute to that in a, in a tiny way and just to you yeah. know to be able to kind of bring people's attention to to um to these artworks and and um to you know what what they're implying and yeah and you know i hope that people find the essays uh interesting though i did i did speak to like an acquaintance um a, about the art i'm someone who's very interested in the art and you know they th their reaction was you know why would you attack something like Titian's The Rape of Europa because it's a beautiful painting huh. there shouldn't be we shouldn't find we shouldn't be finding fault with something like that and and so I thought that was an interesting response and I just said well we're not finding fault with it I think we're just re recontextualizing this painting which I think makes it more interesting you know it makes it relevant to our times but I think that there is this resistance maybe um, well yeah but it's that that's it's like everything right now right you know it's just like yeah are you allowed to watch the films made by a filmmaker who has yeah. you know been in trouble for some things that are exactly. yeah. need to have never have happened you know and it's like does yeah. can you really separate the art from the artist can you really separate exactly. the art from who paid for it I don't know you know like I don't think any of us have clear answers no, to any of no, that it's a fascinating it's a fascinating discussion I think yeah, absolutely. And within all that, so Penelope had a violent encounter with um, Julian, uh, mm -hmm. a character that we we spend time with in the novel, but never actually, we don't ever see um, Christine and Julian back in the same space at the same mm -hmm. time, um, but which I, I want to talk about later. But, <laughs> um, but so she is unpacking that amidst all sorts of things. You know, there's like a real theme of permanence versus impermanence in this novel mm -hmm. of things that are changing and passing and that we don't have control over the things that are changing and passing and um you know Penelope is getting ready through this whole dirt the whole story to leave the home that she's been in for this long time and live a more nomadic life in a mobile a home that actually like moves um but in the midst of trying to get there she's also trying to come to terms with um, this memory she has of this violent encounter with Julian um, and the art seems to be in relationship with her trying to come to terms with that memory mm -hmm. um, for you what was that like trying to build out those parallels and figure out how far to go with how much she was revealing of what happened and what didn't she, what she didn't reveal of what happened um, what what was that process like for you in terms of building those two parallel things out in the storytelling? Um, so Penelope's backstory, I guess that that was actually inspired by a Turner painting, um, mm -hmm. uh, the Rape of Proserpine, 
Um, and, you know, in, in that painting, um, Proserpine is in, in, in a corner of the painting. She's barely visible. Mm. But what's more visible is this, um, this barren tree kind of in the foreground of the painting. And in the back, um, in the background of the painting, kind of in the middle, you see um, this kind of ruinous castle or fortress in the distance. Um, so that just kind of um, got me thinking about like different kinds of ruination. So you have, you know, the ruination of the building, um, of, 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 you know, the, the, the dying tree and the ruination of a person. So, uh, so that's where that came from. And from there, I started doing research about representations of sexual violence in art. Um, so that kind of then became a part of the character. So initially she really didn't have, she didn't have that backstory. It was, it was, you know, just her being in this house. Uh, going through the archive um, and I think that adding that really changed the overall tone of, yeah. of the story um, and, and and of course it changed the relationship between between these two characters so I wanted to um, to tell a part of the story from from his perspective in some ways I wanted to explore the psychology of of someone who who has done such a thing um, who's yeah done such a crime um, and yeah, and, and that was quite challenging because, you know, he is a character who is very opaque to himself. So it was hard to uh, portray that opacity because um, I, you know, at times it felt like I, I couldn't see him very clearly because he couldn't see himself clearly. Wow. Um, so I used, um, yeah, so I wanted them to have very different approaches to art. Um, so he is also someone who is very interested in art. He's obviously a collector, um, but his relationship to art is very much about like possessing certain artworks in a legal capitalistic yes. sense. Like he purchases yeah. and collects them, but he doesn't, they don't speak to him in the same way. And he, he struggles to, to, to understand them despite huh. his attempt to, to, to get to know more art to, you know, he, 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 he struggles to read um, Kafka. So there's all this like attempt to, um, to, I guess, uh, to reach a deeper level of understanding um, and to have, um, to accumulate meaning, which he continually fails to do uh, versus mm. Penelope, um, who, um, for whom art is very much a part of how she relates to the world and how she um and how she uh deals with her own past she feels like she yeah also like well there's this beautiful you know yeah it's beautiful there's a beautiful bookend of the way she projects herself into art too that occurred to me when mm. i was actually going back through the book it didn't hit me the first time through but she looks i can't remember if it's a painting of or a photograph of julian and Aid aiden's family oh yes it's a, a painting yeah a painting and so she she almost wills herself into that family painting mm -hmm. by projecting her, you know, she pr propels herself into first Julian's life and then Aiden's life. And then she now in a weird way has painted herself into their family painting. Mm -hmm. And then in the end, you sum up where she's come to in her projecting. I'm, it feels to me like a younger version of herself or a more innocent version of, or a new reborn version of herself into this la a new landscape of yeah. you know realizing that she's able to let go of certain things and able to let certain things pass by her and that that's okay and that she's gonna what she has is to come home to the people that she loves and and that doesn't matter how impermanent certain things are there's certain things that are going to continue to fulfill her and and move her forward and I thought how interesting that you started the novel with her projecting herself into this family image. And then you end the novel with her projecting herself into the unknown, basically, you know, like sort of, but both of them were paintings. Um, and so in a weird way, it feels like she is living through these images or, or finding her mm -hmm. own sense of memory absolutely. in these images. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The, um, I guess the, the, the images or the, the um the artworks um they're almost like a different kind of like journal you know mm. her, her kind of cataloging of the artworks is a different kind of diary or record keeping um and yeah and to go back to your to your previous question um there's a part i, I um, forgot to answer which is uh her um i guess her her omission of 
the, the details and she never really clearly tells the reader what ha happened yeah and so that was very intentional um, because I read so many um, books uh, about representation of sexual violence um, and, and memoirs as well and you know I, I was very conscious of the fact that um, th there's a fine line between representation and I think commodification and so mm. I didn't want to um, to risk that um, yeah. so it was, it was on the one hand it was an aesthetic choice um, but on the other hand I think it was also ethical for, for me like I wanted to be respectful um, and to be compassionate um, and to bear in mind that you know there are real people who go through this um so so i chose to kind of really step back and 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 that's never so so the 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 event itself is never described um, yeah and there is this kind of void in the middle of the book um that echoes a lot of the other voids you know like the gaps on the the walls and all of these like missing objects so mm. so there it becomes a kind of part of a, a like a motif As many of you know, I love my coffee. I love it in the morning. I love it after lunch. I love it after dinner. I've even been known to take my coffee in the shower with me, which my husband thinks is really weird. But he recently introduced me to Amigo Coffee Roasters, a farm roasted coffee brand from El Salvador that's on a mission to improve coffee's traditional supply chain and give back to our friends who make it all possible. Amigo wants you to join their mission to seek quality and accountability in coffee in our communities and in our world. Visit www.amigoroasters.com, learn about their mission, but more importantly, you can support them by making a purchase. And for all you listeners, they have been kind enough to give you a 15% discount. Just go to www.amigoroasters.com and use the code Jen's Bookshelf at the checkout. I mean, I, I hope that that um that that it worked. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I listen, I'm no expert, but in my experience of reading it, I feel like it really works. It it may it leads me to my next thing, actually, though, which is uh what I was starting to mention earlier about the fact that we wait and wait and wait for Julian to to arrive at Mornington. <laughs> yeah. And then the book ends before he gets there. <laughs> he's like about to be there. Um, I'm like, wait, what do you mean he's a month away? Like, um, but um have you ever thought about like a book two where because I I mean I can't help but just be I, I have this fantasy of just seeing how this all plays out I mean it's it's such a compelling setup of you know the the brothers but both of them having been intimate with Penelope so you know Penelope originally has a relationship with Julian there's a violent act that occurs there's also a sort of I don't know. It feels like there's a tension that's between them. That's always a bit unhealthy mm -hmm. or toxic in their relationship. At least that seems to be implied in the journal entries. Mm -hmm. um, she's anticipating having to see Julian again, now that she's married his brother or life partners with his brother and has quite a beautiful relationship with Aiden. It feels like it seems like a very balanced and like what really struck me is that they give each other a lot of liberties. You know, that I don't feel like they're on top of each other to need to know everything about each other in every given moment, even though they're living in a time where they are kind of living on top of each other, you know? Um, but um, I just feel like you have just set the most incredible stage for the three of them having to deal with each other. Are we, is there another, is there landscapes? a more landscapes or <laughs> um no not not at the moment I mean I yeah I guess uh yeah other readers have told me that they were surprised that yeah they never knew because it seems to be building up to that so I wanted um something that was kind of not an anti-climax um but um, my editor says it's like a decrescendo you know mm. it, it seems to build up to something but actually doesn't um and so it, it's because for me that that's more true to life yeah you anticipate certain meetings or events and they don't happen um, yeah and of course because of the way it's written so so you know julian's chapters are set in april mm -hmm. um, and penelope's diaries end in march so we are like readers already know he's not going to go back um, and they will never meet but she does not know that by the mm. by the time the book ends she is still anticipating this encounter and kind of um you know telling herself that she is brave enough to to face him yeah um, but that's actually never going to happen um and I think that 
the tur him turning back or turning away um, was an important part of his character, his in his inability to to face himself in his past. So he has a kind of like pseudo epiphany towards the end of his section, um, where he seems to be um, coming to some sort of realization, but it's never clear what that is. Yeah, and that's intentional as well. Um, and so you know the readers never really get to know what happened to him and Penelope doesn't as well uh, either. So it's, there's, yeah, I wanted to, for um, him to remain quite an ambiguous um, character. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that the, the choice to, to not return, to not see her um, is something that kind of matches the rest of um, him as, yeah. as, a, as a person. Yeah. How do you think Aiden yeah. feels about all of it in the end? <laughs> <laughs> um yeah it's uh yeah he's he's I, I regret not kind of sketching more of him it just it, it was really out of consideration for space um I didn't oh of want, course I didn't want a very long novel um you know I wanted something that's kind of compact um but I think that there's the the, the relationship be between the two brothers is definitely not a great one so there's there's always been tension between them and and um there's one part where where uh you know um we, we find out that Aiden knew about Julian's previous romantic relationships and he disapproved with uh of how Julian had handled those relationships so, yeah. so all of this happened before either of them met Penelope so there's mm. this, this this history of I suppose tension and and resentment um towards one another um and and we know that they you know they 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 share the the loss of their mother so neither of them really had uh, a very happy childhood and their father was very absent um so i i hope that those details kind of hint at the sort of upbringing that they had um mm. and and also just to highlight how different that the, the you know they become despite yeah. the fact that they share um very similar um circumstances as children yeah. yeah and also i feel like um just thinking about their upbringing versus penelope's upbringing mm -hmm. versus some of the world around them because mm -hmm. as you built out this sort of oh gosh i don't even know it's in the near future but climate crisis mm -hmm. post climate crisis situation um you talk about these big domes that are over certain sections of things for there to be breathable air and uh, you know places that have been so touched by catastrophe that they're unlivable um, and it feels like that very much speaks to class and who can afford to mm -hmm. live in places where the air is breathable or where they're untouched by catastrophe um what was your intention there in terms of what you were wanting to roll into this whole journey in terms of class and what that means as we're facing a climate crisis in the world right now yeah i mean class was a very important um subject for me so i always knew i wanted to bring that in and that that was partly um the reason why you know i want to to set in the country estate as well because i think the country house is a symbol of privilege um, mm. and of wealth and of course a lot of these houses were funded using money from from the colonial enterprise so so there's that aspect to yeah to history as well um and um yeah and penelope coming from you know working class background has a very different approach to ideas of possession you know so she for her um possession of an artwork for example happens through understanding through living with the art and mm. loving caring for a, a, um, a, a piece of art whereas for for julian it's very much about possessing in terms of buying it and right having it on his wall um and yeah and i think that you know um when it comes to relation between class and the the climate crisis that's something that you know i see on the news all the time so a lot of these ideas um i, I don't think they're speculative i think they're really just um they're extrapolated from what we're seeing around us you know and i it's it's very despairing so uh a lot of times i felt like i couldn't read the news i couldn't read i, I couldn't continue to read more about like yeah. forest fires and floods and just it, it was just so overwhelming yeah and they just seem to be happening at greater intensity every year it just seems to be getting worse and worse you know um yeah. so when i started i remember um someone told me oh we'll never flood in europe 
like that doesn't happen. but then it did happen yeah. um, and so it was it was surreal that it, what had what we had assumed to be speculative has become reality um and all the details about the um the ash trees the ash dieback um disease that's actually from the woodland trust website um, mm. in england and so they have a list of all of these um you know um diseases that are affecting trees and uh, as a result of um of climate change um and wow. you know a lot of these houses are threatened you know by the heat and also like uh insect insect infestation so all of that's real um and yeah so it's quite it's quite terrifying um yeah you uh, said i think there's all of this the, the quote in there somewhere was like there was a time when catastrophe felt far away yeah. and i was like oh god oh <laughs> no that's it just feels so ominous it, as we speak maui's on fire know, and people yeah. are jumping into the ocean to try I to know, get away it's, from it yeah it's just yeah. It's so wild it really um, is, yeah. and you feel so helpless. It's like, what does one person do to try to make a difference and try to contribute in a way that could be productive? Um, yeah. And also that also makes me think about though, how um, Penelope talks about, well, you were saying, you know, she grew, she grew up very, very working class, but then she ends up in this art history world, which tends to be very kind of uh privileged in a certain way if for yeah. someone to be able to do that so in a way she's like aspiring her way out of this working class existence through her um intellectualism in mm -hmm. some way or academia and mm -hmm. yet she's living in a time where the world is starting to fall apart and the structures mm -hmm. of all of these academic things are falling apart and she's questioning whether or not she should have learned something more practical. You know, it's like mm -hmm. she could write all these beautiful essays and really thoughtful essays and project herself into these images and archive all these books. And yet she's thinking we're living in a time in the world where, but how do I, how do I make a fire? How do I make a mobile home? How do I sustain my life when there isn't an institution to go study at, or there isn't a place mm -hmm. to go where it makes sense for her to get a degree or a PhD, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, I feel like that feels devastatingly um, possible right now. Is that coming Absolutely. from your own fears? Was that also coming from research or, you know, oh, where is that coming from? Yeah, I mean, I definitely felt that way. I mean, I still do feel that way, a sense of helplessness. Um, and, you know, her, her, I guess, disillusionment with academia is very much my own. Mm. Um, so I, I felt that... You know, I wanted to do something different because I felt like I wasn't kind of engaging enough with with um, the world. And um, and I remember reading this this novel by the German writer um, Jenny Erpenbeck called "Go Went Gone." It's absolutely fantastic. Okay. I highly recommend it if you haven't read it. Mm -hmm. um, so it's about um, a retired professor who um, befriends a group of refugees in, in Berlin. And there was this one line in there where. Um, he says something like, you know, I've read all of Nietzsche, um, but I don't know what to do when food runs out. Um, so there's this, yeah, it's like the, the practical knowledge and also just that kind of um, the, the, the social relationships that we form with others. Um, so I wanted to do something that, um, yeah, would engage with the world and engage with others in a more direct way. Um, I'm not sure. I, I think fiction does do that to some extent, um, but I don't think a single person or a single um uh, kind of work could could make any uh, meaningful changes I think it's only collectively that we can make change um, yeah so I do think there's still hope and I wanted there to be a sense of hope at the end of the book um, there's absolutely sure. yeah. yeah it comes through don't worry <laughs> <laughs> like I said again I'm not an expert I can only tell you my own experience but um yeah. but yeah no I definitely felt that where, where did your love for writing start? Was this something like, were you five years old and you knew you wanted to be a writer or is this something evolved over time? What's, what's that been like? Um, I, I can't remember when I started um, wanting to write. I mean, I did write some stories when I was an undergrad, so maybe it was around that time, but I never showed anyone of those stories, so they were not published. It was just for my own pleasure. And then I, I did graduate school and um, completely forgot about creative work. Um, so I did that for, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, more more than like about 15 years. Um, well, what did you study in graduate school? English Lit. Yeah, so that oh, English Lit. Background. Okay. 
yeah, so that was my original goal was to to go into academia. Um, and so I was very, very, you know, um, devoted to my academic research and all of that. Um, but because of circumstances, uh, I had to do other kinds of work and then gradually just decided to to transition into to creative writing. Um, and uh, I think it was 2016, I did like a continuing education course in Vancouver at the Simon Fraser University. And that was my first um, attempt at serious creative writing. Oh, um, that's wow. kind of around the time when I started thinking about the novel. Um, and yeah, and we, you know, we had to submit work uh, throughout this, the semester. Um, so I, I started writing um, and, and yeah, that's how it happened, but it, it was not something I planned. Um, yeah, and, and I wish I had started earlier in life. Um, I think maybe just things would have been really different or I would have written differently if if I, if I were younger um but yeah I, I think you know it's I enjoy fiction writing a lot or just like creative work a lot because I think yeah. it allows for a certain kind of freedom and open-endedness that I didn't get um in academic writing um which kind of I think demands more kind of like clear cut uh divisions more just more clarity yeah um, and I like the kind of ambiguity that fiction allows yeah yeah and so as we're getting to the end of our time here I always my last question is always um was there a piece of advice someone gave you along the way that you felt like stuck with you or kind of helped you push through from academia to I'm going to be a fiction writer and I'm going to commit to writing this novel um, you know, was there anything along the way that was advice given to you that you could share with our listeners? Um, I actually did think about this question because I know you asked this at the end <laughs> of the interviews um, and I couldn't think of anything that anyone told me like in person. Um, but I, I collect a lot of quotes from artists, from writers, you know, when when they they give yeah. advice. Um, and I have like an entire notebook of, of quotes, um, especially when I was first starting out and I didn't really have uh, many writer friends. So, so these quotes are very um, important to me. And the one that really sticks out is actually from Louise Bourgeois, the, the French artist, mm -hmm. um, whom I reference a lot in the book. And she she has this quote, I think it's from, from an interview, actually, where she, um, I'm paraphrasing something like, art exhausts me, yet I work every day of my life. Um, mm. And I think it's just like a reminder to persevere, yeah. regardless of what happens, and yeah. to always come back, sorry, That's okay. to, to the desk, to keep reading and keep writing um and so that's kind of what I try to to, to remind myself I love myself that of yeah it. yeah it, I, that makes a lot of sense and in that too I'm realizing are you you must be an incredibly avid reader because you yes. I'm assuming you've read everything you archived in this book um yes <laughs> how, nice. how do you have a regimen antiquarium? <laughs> yeah. Do you have a regimen to your day that gives you space to know that you're going to be able to read for a certain amount of time and write for a certain amount of time, or is it just you know random when it happens? Or how does that how does that look for you? Yeah, I read. I try to read every day. I mean, there are some days when it's you know more difficult. Um, I don't write every day, so I I um, kind of write when I've accumulated enough ideas from the readings. I mean, I, I still think that reading is is the most important part of, mm. of the writing process. Um, and I, I'm also, you know, a book collector. I, I, I collect books way faster than I can read them. Um, but I just, I mean, I love being uh, around books and to, to always kind of be engaging with them and having these like kind of dialogues. It's amazing. Them. <laughs> well, again, thank you so much for, for joining us. I it, Landscapes is just such a beautiful, intimate, internal journey that I, like I expanded my horizons in multiple ways as I read it, which is just such an unusual thing to not only just enjoy or read so much, but also be able to learn so much. So um, yeah, thank you for hanging out with us. Thank you so much for having me. It's been